This is a special breaking news edition of Judaism Unbound, Intermarriage, Changing the Rules. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofus. And we are here today for the first time that we have released a sort of rapid response breaking news edition of Judaism Unbound. Normally, we record our episodes a few weeks in advance and edit them pretty heavily and release them down the road. But today we are recording this episode with the hopes that we're going to be releasing it the very next day. And that's because our guest today, Rabbi Amichai Lalavi, is making news. He is a rabbi ordained by the conservative movement, and the conservative movement has a prohibition upon upon its rabbis performing intermarriages, that is, performing marriages between Jews and those who are not Jews. But Amichai has put out a paper called Joy, which is accessible on his website. We'll have links to it in our show notes, in which he lays out the reasons that he is going to start performing such marriages. Amichai has engaged in a year of study in preparing this report and this position, and we are eager to talk to him about the reasons why he has made this choice for himself and his community, which he is very clear about limiting the impact of what he's talking about to his own community. And yet, of course, there are implications for other communities. Already there is a synagogue in New York called B'nai Jeshurun, whose rabbis recently announced that they also will be performing intermarriages despite their relationship to the conservative movement. So this is clearly something that is in the air, and we are very eager to understand the thinking behind it. And we're really honored to have with us today Rabbi Amichai Laulavi. Amichai, thank you so much for joining us on Judaism Unbound. We're eager to get your thoughts and put them into the hopper of our thinking here on Judaism Unbound. Thank you. Good to be back, my friends. Great to have you. So just starting out, uh, I think it'd be great if you could, in your own words, tell our listeners about the document, the project that you just uh, put out, what drove it, and what the contribution is from your perspective. In the last year since I was ordained from the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, which was in May 2016, I took to task um, ways in which I can respond to my community where Jews who marry people of other faith and heritage are a very high percentage. I receive between three and five requests a week for weddings. Many of those are either between Jews and those of other faith uh, and or Jews and what we call patrilineal Jews, whose father is Jewish and mother is not. Um, I chose to be ordained by the conservative movement for a host of philosophical and theological reasons. Um, but uh, knowingly am now bound by the rabbinical assembly of the movement's decision to not allow conservative rabbis to officiate weddings between Jews and others. Um, So I was, like many others, in a bind between saying yes to my community and yes to the many couples who are uh, joining my community through this act of wedding and saying yes to my community um, of rabbinical authority and allegiance. And I am not a believer in either or. I think we're moving from the binary either or to a more complicated both and fluidity. And I believe that that needs to have ramifications for our evolution as halachic thinkers as well. And so if the history shows us that there are very clear distinctions and boundaries between the either or of Jew, you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, history and modern reality is showing that actually there's a greater fluidity and that there are those who are not exactly either or, but in some strange way, in a beautiful way, both and. And if in the historical models, there are smaller numbers of such liminal categories, the 21st century is actually looking at a much larger numbers, both of Jews who choose to marry people who are not or not yet Jewish, and very high numbers of those people who marry Jews who might not or not yet convert to Judaism, but nevertheless are very active members of the Jewish community in very different ways. Those couples and those peoples are the ones towards whom I felt I must make a stronger reach and a stronger case and say yes, as opposed to say no. 
So how is this different from what might go on in, in sort of the reform movement in terms of intermarriage? I mean, as I understand what you're talking about is, is you're saying, well, in the movements that don't focus on Jewish law or uh, a, a sort of Jewish legal way of thinking as core, they've kind of made this assessment already and said that it that it's best to perform intermarriages. And in a sense, you're putting out there that uh, an argument for even those who use Jewish law as a, as a fundamental lens through which to look at Judaism, that they too uh, might go in this direction by reconceptualizing some of the categories of Jewish law that have been in play in the past? Correct. I think that Jewish law, uh, or halakha with a capital H, as Rabbi uh, Gordon Tucker proposes, has the ability for further agility. The reason I chose the conservative movement is because in 2006, the responsa was passed that allowed LGBT students to become rabbis and allowed rabbinic uh, authorities in the conservative movement to officiate same-sex weddings. As someone who's an out gay man, I saw that as not only a welcome breeze, but as an affirmation of the agility of halacha and the halachic process. It was unheard of in the movement 10 years prior, as women's ordination was unheard of 20 years prior. So we have ways to be flexible and agile when the dignity and the love of human beings is at stake. And my project here was to go into halakha, to look into the halachic history, to examine the status and the categories that existed in Jewish history, sometimes within halachic frames, see which of those might apply, which of those might need a lot of work from people who are experts in the halachic process in a way far greater than my short bandwidth, and come up with a solution that will offer us a nuanced approach within an expanded but respectful halachic process. Now, with all my due respect and dear love to my friends within the Reform and the Reconstructionist movement, with whom I am aligned in many, many ways, what I'm offering is not a solution necessarily just for myself. I'm offering it to my conservative colleagues who, like me, are really in a bind. The proposal that I've written is for me and my community. I need to take care of my community, but I'm not in isolation. I'm aware that people are reading this, that are talking about this, that rabbis across the spectrum and community leaders globally are looking for ways to affirm and celebrate what de facto is already the reality. Here I'm coming to this question sort of as a as a lawyer, and and it's interesting to me that for our our uh, listeners who may be lawyers to use this as an opportunity to think about Judaism through the lens of being a lawyer, right? And sometimes I, I think that the way that Jewish law is often thought about uh, doesn't necessarily uh, make use of some of the legal theory that we've come to develop in the 20th century. And and I'm wondering if you could sort of walk us through your legal thinking here. As I understand it, basically, what where you started is looking at a set of what we could call precedents that suggested that to for a rabbi to marry a Jew and a non-Jew is not the right thing to do Jewishly. And how did you look at those precedents? And then what did you bring in to uh, be the counterweight to those precedents? So I want to say that what I'm offering here is simultaneously a model of continuity and a model of discontinuity, that it is in the context of Jewish thinking and certainly progressive Jewish thinking. My original idea, my premise was that there are precedents in Jewish history that point at this liminal category of someone who both is and isn't Jewish. In the uh, rabbinic world of the early Talmudic rabbis, that category was called ger toshav, resident alien, permanent resident, green card holder. That's the general gist. The rabbis took the biblical verses that are not clear about the other who lives with us, and the other is known as ger. Ger is not a convert. That is a later term. Ger is other. It's stranger. 
we are reminded that we were once Girim, we were the ones who were strangers, and we were the ones who were the suspected others. And so we are commanded to love the other and the stranger. And just in the verses chanted this past week in the synagogue of the weekly Torah portion, there is one law for the citizen and for the ger, other, as one. What we don't have is the smoking gun, which is a halachic authority that says you may marry someone who is in the ger to shav category. So my original idea was let's find a way to link the ancient Roman Jewish history to today's American Jewish history. It's a big leap. I then went to look at other categories. Yirei Hashem, the pious ones, existed at the same time a little bit later within the Roman Empire as well. The pious ones joined the Jews in ritual ways and sometimes family ways. We do not have evidence of them converting. We don't have clear instructions for them marrying Jews. You know, my relationship with halakha and Jewish law is complicated, and I um, chose the conservative movement because of my adherence to the philosophical underpinnings of conservative Judaism that dances the difficult dance of antiquity and modernity and allegiance to tradition and allegiance to now. So we looked at the halakha, we looked at the legal options, my team and I, and we actually concluded that to be authentic to the halachic process as is right now, I do not have the authority to say, let's reclaim Ger Toshav as is. But here's what I can say. Let's reclaim Beruach Ger Toshav in the spirit of that status. Let's spend the next years figuring out what it might look like to recognize the reality of our civilization in a post-ethnic, not quite yet, but getting to post-patriarchal, non-binary, self-chosen affiliation lifestyle where more and more people are Jewish, half Jewish. I'm with you. I'm not converting. Maybe. Figure out what's our communal responsibility to these people and our families. And can we find a solution that is rooted in our history, even if it isn't verbatim? So that was the process. I spent uh, about six months really scouring through the Talmudic, Halachic, other sources of Ger Toshav, Yirei Hashem, others, and then actually went to the deeper question. And the deeper question, what is at the root of the rabbinic prohibition on intermarriage? How much of that is that valid today? And how much of that prohibition requires us to go even deeper in a root canal into investigating the fears, both legitimate and over the top, and what of that needs to guide us today. All of the headlines that I've seen about your shift and what is happening also with a recent prominent congregation in, in Manhattan, their leadership deciding to make a similar shift, um, all of the headlines are about marriage. But when you speak about Ger Toshav and this resident alien, to me, it's actually a far bigger question than marriage. To me, like, I think of my friend who, just as one example, who in Philadelphia began the conversion process and decided he wasn't going to convert, but actively took on for himself this category of Ger Toshav. More and more, there are people, whether it's in synagogue contexts or in other Jewish organizational contexts, etc., that may actually not have a partner who is Jewish but are just interested in Judaism for whatever reason, and they're not looking to convert. So to me, this is identifying a trend in society that is not just about how we're structuring families, but actually how we're behaving in general in a society where being a member of a religious group does not dictate that you, that you do not participate in some other religious group's activity. So I guess I'd just love to hear a little bit more about in addition to marriage, what could this conceivably mean for 21st century Judaism and beyond? No, that's a great question. I think the, the marriage issue is so big, and it's become so big because really the rabbi's responsibility that has become so in officiating the wedding, and yes or no has become like a big, a big uh, game changer. But I totally agree. It is way before and way after that one day of marriage. Um, I just led a B mitzvah ceremony yesterday. B mitzvah is the lab shul, gender neutral 
way of doing bar and bat mitzvahs. And this particular family had a mother who's born Jewish and involved in the Jewish community and a husband who wasn't born Jewish and has not converted, but is very much part of the community, our community. And their 13-year-old daughter just was fantastic. <laughs> and both his family and her family of origin were there, absolutely welcome, part of the ceremony, uh, speaking very, very movingly about how grateful they were to be part of this tribe and that their daughter is growing up with these values and these stories. Now, will the father convert at some point? He actually might at this point because he's had such a great last four or five years that he feels like, wow, I, I feel closer. Why hasn't he so far? Well, in his particular case, it's specific. But in other cases, either people don't feel that they are religious, they don't believe in God. Conversion is absolutely pitched as a religious act for good reason. I am with you. Your God is my God. Your people are my people. Maybe in the other order. And um, whether it's the dunking in the mikveh and whether it is the declaration of faith and the type of study, it has been pitched and it is pitched as a religious conversion. But many people join the Jewish partner and the Jewish family and community because of the culture, because of the ideology, because of the food, because of the family, because of the symbols, because of Israel, because of Hebrew, because of curiosity, because of suffering, etc. So people are joining us and they're not going full on, so to speak, by converting because conversion is so binary and it's so not where we are right now, especially people like 50 and younger. It's just not where we are. We're both and we're hyphenated. At the same time, like your friend and many of my friends are just joining and they're part of. And it's our job, again, to be as welcoming as inclusive as possible because love opens doors. And then more than that, present and keep on producing the best damn Jewish stuff we can so that people like yesterday after this be mitzvah come and say, wow, I didn't know that Judaism is so rich. It has so much to offer me. I want to know more. On the one hand, we're seeing a sort of liminal status of non-Jews who are actually in some way closer to, you know, have some some Jewish Jewishness to them. Uh, and we could sort of find this this middle status. And I'm also wondering if that's true to a large extent about many Jews. And, and, and it would stand to reason that they would be that 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 Jews are also not looking to be uh, with both feet in this sort of separate category of Jew. And they also hold a certain liminal status. And so the question is, in a way, whether this is is not necessarily creating a, a class B Jew, but it, but it nevertheless is creating a, a, a new category of people of Jewish and non-Jewish heritage who in some fashion occupy some liminal space that Judaism might very well enrich. Totally. That's a great point. Look, on the one hand, I feel like I and many of us are in triage. This is like first aid. We need to Right? Everyone's like, oh my God, we're hemorrhaging Jews all the time. Someone wrote me an email yesterday. You are creating the second Holocaust. For this, your father survived Buchenwald. I've gotten a few of those. And I'm saying, okay, fine. So we're hemorrhaging Jews. I get it. But first of all, how do we get here? What's going on here? Um, and what can we do about it? So what can we do about it is I am saying, let's start off by saying hello and welcome and yes. And then there's more chances that you and your partner will show up. And let's see from there. Because the moment I say no, you don't show up and we totally lose you. So from that hemorrhaging point of view, this is, not, this is way more than a Band-Aid. Now, how do we get here? Okay, we got here because in the bigger reality of 21st century post-ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, people choose its consent over descent and belief over blood and people are opting in in ways that our ancestors did not, and there's a big generational shift here. The Jews are only part of the bigger conversation here, and our numbers are actually a little better than other ethnic groups. So there is a zeitgeist. For the Jewish community, one can say sadly, and one does not spit into wells one drinks from, that there has been about a century of a lot of hand-wringing 
and a lot of providing Jewish content in institutional context that did not speak to people's deep needs, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, politically, etc. And, um, you know, we're also 70 years post-Holocaust, and we are still in PTSD, and we're still driven by fear and angst, theologically and spiritually, and we're working on being robust and coming from love and not from fear. So those are all the reasons. Now, here's the deal. I get a few hundred people who join me for Lab Shul Shabbat, and we're a four-year-old community. More and more people are joining. But the majority of the thousands of people who are part of the Lab Shul community show up three or four times a year. They show up for High Holy Days. They will usually show up for Seder. They will probably show up for another Shabbat. They will show up for somebody's B mitzvah. So can I ask of the person of another faith or heritage to do more Jewishly than their partner? If the partner is going to show up four times a year and probably read the New York Times before she reads the foreword and care about Israel but really be involved in their civic politics, and be Jewishly ignorant, not because they chose to, because that's what they, they got, and are interested enough to start building a Jewish identity through their wedding, through their first child, through their child's be mitzvah, their, their partner is going to be in the same boat. So we need to be realistic in what we're asking of people and how we invite people for a deeper conversation with what Judaism has to offer not because we're asking people to save Judaism, but we're asking people to give themselves, ourselves, the gift of a technology for spiritual, intellectual living of worth. That's what Judaism has to offer your life. And when I pitch it this way, both the Jew and the partner are saying, oh, sign me up. And when I meet with a couple for six months prior to their wedding, and use that as an opportunity to understand what we have to offer, revised and rebranded for the 21st century for their lives, then they come back because they want it, because they get how useful it is. You know, as I'm listening to you, I, I can't help but picture in my mind something that we talked about uh, when we were talking about uh, Passover, not, not, not you and I, but when uh, we were doing those shows about Passover and just thinking about how uh, when you leave, when, when the Israelites left Egypt and they picked up a mixed multitude with them, right? In other words, that they were, that they knew they had to move away from something, from a way that things had been. And when they did step forward in that interesting way, others joined them, right? And then they had to sort of be willing to wander for a while without knowing the answer of where they were going, but they also couldn't just sit there um, at where they were. I have a lot of respect, despite my, uh, my, uh, my wild nature, for boundaries. And I understand the validity of the concern over the model that I'm proposing and that many other people are proposing that is, in fact, the, the definition of our lives. It is so much comf more comfortable to know where the door is and where the border is and who's in and who's out and who's right and who's wrong and, you know, the binaries to play chess within the rules of chess. I wish it was that simple. And I understand why politically and ideologically in our world, so many people are reacting with nostalgic and with exclusivist claims about in, out, yes, no, black, white, Jew, not Jew, gay, straight, because the fear of the fluid. I get the fear of the fluid. And I respect it. And yet here we are. And I am where I am as a rabbi because the fluid has honored my dignity as someone who's not in the, in the heterosexual biblical model of what's kosher and what's traif. And so it is for my friends who are women rabbis. And so it is for many of us who are challenging modernity and its privileges with its other gifts of all this blurriness. So if you look at the Bible, it's full of these stories. You know, when Ruth says to Naomi, her mother-in-law, your people are my people, your God is my God, where you live, I live, where you die, I die, she is not converting. She is walking into her mother-in-law's life because she chooses to, it's her choice. A 
a sister-in-law chooses another choice. When Queen Esther is married to Achashverosh for survivalist reasons, we're not blaming her for being intermarried. When Moses is married to Tzipporah, when King Solomon marries half the Middle East, <laughs> right? Those were models. And then comes our rabbis in the Roman times and the ones after who were able to balance our fear of being diluted. It's a legitimate fear. We have a treasured legacy that can easily become a garnish, that can become just a meme, that can become a bagel on the table. And saying, how do we pass on what we've got responsibly while being also responsible to the lives of the people who chose to live and to love. We have to, na- we have to navigate them both. I want to dig deeper into that, that clash of the ancient and the contemporary, because what may surprise some of our listeners in terms of the document you wrote is that you devote extensive, and, and, and maybe it won't surprise them based on the conversation you had before about your deep respect for Jewish law, but um, you, you spend a number of chapters really digging deep into millennia and centuries old conversations within the Jewish rabbinic realm on, on Gerto Shav, on all of these questions. And I guess a question that I want to pose to you, because Dan and I tend to come from a different place. Uh, in, in, the, in the general question of sort of ancient precedent versus contemporary right thing to do, even if it doesn't have an ancient precedent, we often are on the side of, you know what? Jews today should go wild and try whatever new modalities of Judaism they would like to, even if they don't have an ancient precedent. I consider my rabbinic role in the context of a relay race. I am very privileged to have received Jewish knowledge, Jewish upbringing by my family and teachers and have access to the toolbox, to the hard drives of Jewish living. And it is my responsibility to pass this on to my children, to my students, to my community, to whoever wants to make Judaism relevant in their lives. And relevant might be exclusively Jewish, it might be significantly Jewish, it might be primarily Jewish, I don't know. But to pass on the Jewish values onwards. And we're living in a smorgasbord and in a, you know, mix your own salad reality where anything goes. Fine, let's compete. We have what to offer. And part of what we have to offer is a rich civilization that has morphed and has moved from culture to culture, accruing knowledge and solidifying its core and being flexible when needing to, and being inflexible when having to. And this is where I come from. This is where we come from. Not paying attention to our precedent, the ones we like and the ones we don't like, is irresponsible. And so analyzing the halachic history, analyzing how the ones on whose shoulders we sit grappled with similar dilemmas gives me and gives us not just precedent, but the very, the very purpose for what we're doing here in this relay race. We're not, we're not the ones to start this conversation. We are a link in a chain. I come from a long chain of rabbis, and I want to look myself in the mirror. I want to look them in the face. I want to look my brother and my uncle and my cousin in the face and say, I know that what I'm proposing might seem like heresy and might seem like the end of the line, but here's where I come from. Here's who I've been in conversation with, and they include contemporary rabbis and ones long deceased. They include some of our ancestors, and they include people who are unquestionably the pillars of Jewish thought. So you can call me a heretic, you can call me a lot of names that I've been called in the last week, but you cannot call me someone who hasn't done the work of asking the questions in the context of the cultural, theological, sociological milieu we come from. And, um, you know, some very important rabbis said a lot of things to me off the record about this. One of them I, <laughs> I did quote, um, which says, mm-hmm. this is in many ways a moment of pikuach nefesh. This is a moment of emergency. This is when you 
go to that strange thing on the wall that says break in case of emergency. You break the glass to take out the hammer to forget what you do with the hammer. I never have to do one of those things, but you know what I mean, right? And, um, and we do that because if we keep saying no, we are seriously losing high, high numbers. I'll speak for myself only. If I were to keep on saying no to the couples who want to come be married in my community, because one of them is not Jewish and is not converting, they're walking away. They're walking away from me. They're walking away from my community. They're likely walking away from a Jewish wedding. And they're likely walking away from the Jewish community. We can fix that by going into the past, taking what we can, tweaking it as needed, and proposing a nuanced model that can meet our needs. What I'm also hearing in what you're t- talking about and what you're doing, and I'm wondering how you respond to this, is a dialogue to some extent between rabbis and Jewish people. I think the sort of people's history of conservative Judaism is it's the people who are kind of looking for this middle ground, this middle position between uh, sort of as Lex was describing earlier, sort of like not being too concerned about the past versus being overly concerned about the past and who are really looking for this uh, middle position. But what's interesting to me is that I do think that the Jews themselves look at this differently from most conservative rabbis. And I'm wondering if whether something is going on here that that potentially is also bringing together the Jews and the rabbis into a place of mutual respect and concern where both are actually listening to the other. Partly you can phrase it in terms of it's an emergency. If we don't do this, people will leave Judaism. But I, I think that even more powerfully, it's a statement that there are all these people who previous generations sort of thought of as ones who didn't care much and wanted to leave Judaism. And the reality is, is that they don't want to leave Judaism. They're actually desperate to be part of it. But if there's not a road that's given to them that makes them feel like they are a legitimate part of it, then then they're going to leave or then they'll go somewhere else. And the the question that I've heard in the past, the, the phraseology that I've heard in the past, in particular from conservative rabbis is, yeah, I see that, but sorry, my hands are tied because I'm governed by Jewish law and I don't see, uh, there's no way for me to do this. And in a way, I, I think that what you're at least exploring here is the question of when a when a rabbi listens very carefully to the needs of the people and the opportunities for the people, perhaps there are ways to think about Jewish law in creative ways that make that possible. It actually makes me think of something that I saw Rabbi Steve Greenberg say in the bonus features of the movie Trembling Before God, where he tells the story about when somebody brings a chicken to a rabbi and asks whether or not the chicken is kosher, that, that the rabbi should ask tell me about yourself, you know, are you rich or are you poor? You know, meaning what do you need? And if you need it to be kosher, I might not be able to say that it's kosher, but I'm going to try much harder than if you didn't need it to be kosher because you were wealthy and could just go buy another chicken. And somehow that's what I hear going on here. And, and I'm curious if that's what you see. There's two sides to this. One of the challenges with what I'm offering right now that local rabbis do get to be the, the scissors and the bouncers. And, you know, couples are going to come to me or we're going to come to you in Minnesota or to her in New Orleans and say, well, am I or am I? Am I a Jew? Am I a Joy? Can you say yes? And the concern is that individual clergy will have to be the ones making those decisions. So the fact is that's true. That is a challenge. It's kind of happening already. Uh, hiding behind, well, these are the congregational or the, 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 the legal ramifications there's always a blurry boundary that we need to be cognizant of. And if rabbis in the past decided if a chicken is kosher or not, based on the parameters, not just of the chicken, but of the chicken owner, and that is a famous story that Rabbi Greenberg is alluding to, and an important one, then yes, then local clergy have a responsibility. And I am responsible for my local community. I'm not responsible for global jewelry right now. And other rabbis need to be responsible for their local communities. In some way, it's ironic because the more globally connected and implicated we are, I'm still saying there's a local responsibility. So we need to train rabbis on having these conversations. We need to train our communities on opening our doors, on creating compelling Jewish programs that speak to our needs today across the board. And we need to figure out how to have difficult conversations that create common ground for what we all care about, 
which at the end of the day is a good life and life of meaning and life of community and life of care. And I believe that Judaism might not be 100% for many people, but it will be 60% or maybe 40% or maybe 30%. But let it be value-driven and not have to driven. And that's going to change everything. And it's an investment in the future generations. It's a risk, but I think it's a better risk than a categorical no, you are not welcome here. I'm so sorry. I have a question related to, I mean, you you close your document with an important call, which is that you're going to spend five years Five years. It's a long time. It's as much time as virtually anybody in the Jewish community spends studying anything, um, sort of looking into the implications of what this means and and doing so with some really talented people. And I'm curious about that on two levels. The first level is just sort of what is the content, what is the structure of this five-year plan that you are embarking on with with colleagues? And then the other question I have is... I guess the order intrigues me. It reminds me of the famous adage, na'asev and ishma, we will do and then we will understand, or we will do and then we will hear. Um, a famous rabbinic midrash talks about all sorts of different groups of people were offered the, the laws of the Torah and everybody, all the other peoples ask sort of what's in it before they're going to agree to do it. And th- the people of Israel are celebrated because they said, we'll do it and then we'll understand. And I've actually struggled with that for a long time. It's not how I generally think we should go about things. But I, I will say in this particular situation, that's what you did. You you made a big decision. You not said you you did a an action we will do. And then you said we're gonna go and study and we're gonna understand um what the full ramifications are. So I guess just those two levels, what's this five year plan of yours gonna look like and and why'd you go about it in the way that you did? First of all, I'll say again, I'm doing this for my community, for my growing lapsual community that I'm so honored to be co-creating. And if I keep saying no, as of right now, the numbers are simply going to be appalling. And I can, I'm not going to get to the specifics of the individuals who have approached me and my continued no, sorry, until the rabbinical assembly figures it out, will have dire implications for my community and my ministry and my ability to serve my community, which is why I'm here in the first place. So I'm saying yes, and I'm convinced. What I'm not convinced with is what is it gonna really play out as? There's many questions here. I wanna figure out are there other criteria for becoming a joy, a Jew who's also a goy? What's the spectrum? Will people say yes, no, maybe? How is it gonna work out over time as I and others are engaged in conversation with them? We want to do the sociological follow-up of meeting with the couples to whom we say yes and the ones to whom we say no. And we figure that five years is a sizable chunk in both sociological terms and, and, and just life terms to see, well, what happens a few years later? Let's collect some data. Thirdly, I want to have these conversations like the ones we're having right now and like the ones I've been having with rabbis and with individuals and scholars just in this past week and will be having for the next years. Um, There's the beginning of a structure of what these five years would look like. I don't have it fully worked out yet. I uh, really took everything to just get to the finish line of having this proposal done and it's being revised as we speak with more footnotes and some typos. It's, it's going to go up in the next couple of days. So in the very least, it is going to be a, a thorough process of conversations with people who identify or might identify with the status, with rabbis, with faith leaders of other communities to see what they think about this, and uh, with families, and, and see, does this theory have legs? That when you say yes, and you don't insist on conversion, people show up? Will they show up in the numbers we think they'll show up? Will they commit? Will they be interested? And what will be the ramifications and the ripple effect on the Jewish world? I don't know. And it's possible that in five years, I'll come back and say, guys, I changed my mind. This is not working. This needs major revision and refinement. I don't know. Let's come back in five years. I don't think anything is serious in this is worthy of anything less than a generation or two of real exploration. 
in closing, I, I think that you are the substance of what you've you've put out there is something that I, I very much uh, am in favor of, but even more so is the process. I, I think it's so interesting and important to actually understand the process that you've laid out as sort of a third option, right, between the sort of law-focused approach that says either this is lawful or not lawful, and we're only going to change the law if and when we get to a point of being sure that that change is called for, versus an approach that says law is not, law or even custom, right, is not what's at issue here, and we really should just do this because it's right. And I love that middle position that says we have a intuition that this is the right thing, but there's not really a way to know unless we try it, and we're going to not be afraid. And and I think that that's actually sort of a fascinating approach for 21st century American Judaism is to say, this is a time of experimentation. And I'm just sort of thinking and wondering what would that look like if we took that approach uh, in more areas, or maybe to recognize that we actually already have. I think we have. I think, I mean, I'm thinking about it. when I presented this last week, it was the 50th anniversary of the Loving case, where biracial couples that are now a reality in some, but still a, a huge challenge in many other communities in this country, right? That's 50 years. The bathrooms at the place where we had to be mitzvah yesterday have all been liberated from the gender binary, as many bathroom doors are very recently addressing. So... This binary thinking of either or, yes, no, in, out, Jew, other, yes, those are not going away. But the other, the in-between, is where we have grown in many, many ways. And I think we're invited to figure out where is this in-between a place of sacred and a place of growth and not just a response to the inevitability of progress. There is a proactive approach here in this in-betweenness. Again, I am far from being the expert. I spent a year on this. Many more years need to be spent on this. Halachic experts and sociological experts and artists and visionaries and activists will hopefully take this to the next level. And again, there is risk. There is a broken-hearted element to this. Um, at the event last week, I decided almost on a whim to break a glass. And um, after I spoke and Stephen M. Cohen talked and Anita Diamond talked, Tobin Belzer talked, Koshin and Chodo, this beautiful couple of Jew and Joy, whose wedding I'm officiating this coming weekend, uh, got up. I, took a, 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 I brought a glass and I wrapped it in a napkin. And I said, like, when we break a glass at a wedding, we break it because we remember Jerusalem. We remember destruction. We remember the broken at the moment of our greatest joy. So I'm offering a joy proposal, and I do not want to forget Jerusalem and Jewish continuity and people's heartbreak over this. So I broke a glass, and now a bowl with those shards is on my desk as I'm speaking, and it's going to stay on my desk. I will try and carry both, the broken and the complete, and I hope others will join me in carrying this arc, this, this relay race, so that our camp, our community, is welcoming and grows in a healthy, loving way, in maybe a countercultural way to the politics of this country at this moment that discriminates and that indoctrinates hate of other. We need to do everything we can to come with an authentic Jewish voice that says, the other is my brother. We just need to be creative about it. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. That's an incredible note to end on. And I just want to name, uh, I mean, this is the first time we've done an episode like this where an event has happened and we we scramble and we and we get something in just a few days because we really wanted this to be to be timely and and to reflect what you what you spoke about, the the urgency of the moment, the the break the glass. Um you you spoke twice about breaking glass, actually. You spoke about sort of the emergency breaking glass and breaking a glass at a wedding. I think both are, I think both are appropriate. But just thank you so much, Amichai Lalavi, for joining us. And we're really, really excited to continue thinking along with all of those others out there who are doing the same. Thank you. I look forward to a rich conversation. Thank you so much for initiating this one, Lex and Dan. Here's to many more. 
Absolutely. We hope you've enjoyed this special breaking news edition of Judaism Unbound. And we just want to close out this special episode in the same way that we close out all of our episodes by encouraging you to be in touch with us. We enjoy nothing more than when our listeners shoot us a note and uh, it helps us as we think about the future of this podcast and of the Jewish world. So there's a few ways for you to do that. And the first is you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. You can also head to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, you can hit us up via email at dan at nextjewishfuture.org or lex at nextjewishfuture.org. The last plug we like to make is that you can always support us financially with either a monthly recurring donation or a one-time gift, and you can do that at judaismunbound.com slash donate. So thanks so much for listening, and with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>